Pastor, good evening. Welcome to the Sunday evening service. And uh, I appreciate you being here. And on time, thank you also for joining us by way of the internet. Those of you that are doing so, however you're watching and participating in the service tonight, we're sort of thankful that you're doing so. We had a great time this morning and a good, good crowd of folks and uh, both uh, here physically on the property and then, of course, a good number of folks who tuned in as well. And so we praise the Lord for that. <coughs> uh, revive us again. Brother Dave Dalton, if you'll come and lead us. Uh, I almost gave you that page number again. Old habits die hard. But, uh, but anyway, we praise thee, O God, for the son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Let's all stand together and sing Revive Us Again. On that first verse, we praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. On that second verse, we praise Thee, O God, for the Spirit of life who has shown song and it ought to be the cry of our heart revive us again and uh, you know I want to I want to live in a state of revival to be honest with you and uh, you know there's nothing that says we can't uh, have a spirit of revival all the time and uh, we don't have to wait for special meetings or special occasions or whatever but uh, revival is something that is readily available to each of us at any time if, we'll, if we're willing to pay the price. So anyway, let's have a word of prayer as we open the service this evening. And then after we pray, uh, you can be seated and uh, we'll sing another song. Our Father, we thank you for meeting with us. Thank you for the revival that you want to send. It's not as if you are in heaven trying to withhold the blessings of revival upon us. Uh, you uh, were very plain in your word that if your people uh, called by your name would humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways, you said you'd be glad to hear from heaven and forgive our sins and heal our land. I pray that you'd help us this evening. Thank you for these who uh, have chosen to be here. Thank you for yet others who are viewing the service uh, from, uh, from home or wherever they may be. I pray that you'd bless them in a special way. I pray that you'd help us as we uh, glean truth from your word and apply it to our hearts. Father, uh, do something real in this service. In our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. We'll sing all hail the power of Jesus' name.
on that fourth verse. Oh, that with yonder sacred throne we at His feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown Him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown Him Lord of all. All right. Thank you, Brother Dave. Thank you for singing so well. This evening, well, we do want to be mindful to uh, to pray for those in our church family uh, who need a touch from heaven uh, tonight. Uh, I mentioned this morning, Mrs. Barker is at home. She's recovering uh, from pneumonia, and uh, Mary Schneider, she has pneumonia as well. She's currently at uh, Beaumont Hospital in Troy, so I want you to pray for these ladies. And, uh, and then also, of course, we want to pray for Mrs. Saldana. In, uh, in the home going of her, uh, her son, Frank, <clears throat> and uh, so continue to pray uh, for her, if you will. Got word this morning that Mrs. Allabach uh, was under the weather, so pray for her. And then also Mrs. Lepley asks us to pray for her daughter, Sue, as she goes in for a very important doctor appointment on Tuesday. And so we have a lot of needs, to be sure. And uh, in just a few moments, uh, Brother John, he'll, uh, he'll have a word of prayer uh, for them. Uh, I'm going to throw somebody a curveball right now. <clears throat> Brother Tingson, would you mind uh, coming and giving us a uh, just a very short uh, uh, synopsis of what's going on as far as your deputation is concerned? And, and uh, of course, we've been having some missionary uh, videos, but tonight we're going to hear from live and in person Brother Gary Tingson, okay? And uh, hang the video stuff. We got the real McCoy right here. But, uh, but anyway, I appreciate so much Brother Tingson and his, his heart's desire and the burden that God has given him to go back to Australia. How long have you been on deputation now, Brother Gary? Uh, two years. Now. Two years. And uh, I think the average span of deputation, if I'm not mistaken, is uh, between two and three years. And, and uh, God has really given them some momentum in their deputation and then of course this uh, pandemic uh, affected everybody and my heart goes out to uh, men like Brother Gary and uh, Brother Go Oishi in the same same kind of scenario <clears throat> where they have this momentum and boy things are beginning to pick up and all of a sudden everything comes to a screeching halt but, uh, but we do want to pray for all of these men as they seek the Lord's will as they try to do their best to, uh, to get to the field and the Lord knows what's bad. He knew, he knew this was coming. This didn't take him by surprise. And, uh, but Brother Gary, if you'll give us just a just two or three minute uh, testimony of uh, where you guys are in the whole process, and, uh, and then we'll go on from there. Yes, sir. Thank you, Preacher, for uh, allowing me to give this, uh, give this minute or two. But, uh, uh, man, it's great to be back in church, isn't it? And uh, the Lord's been really blessing. Uh, the start of this year, was, uh, we had a lot of momentum going. Uh, I don't know if you've uh, at the end of 2019, what year is it? 20, okay, the end of 2019, we're at 50%, and uh, old age, um, and and now we're at least a 60%. I say at least 60% because we've got we've had churches, we've had two or three churches that have taken us on for support during this time, and um, I'm, I've yet to know how much they'll be giving. Uh, in terms of support, so we're at least 60% of the moment. Uh, today, we we're supposed to be in Canada, and uh, that didn't work out. And so, but uh, that church, uh, Brother Paulus' church, decided to take us on for support anyway. And so, it's been a blessing to see uh, all the churches that we, uh, besides one, but uh, all the churches that we were supposed to meet during this time actually still sent out uh, a love gift and, uh, and has postponed the meeting for further on the year. And so everything's still right on track. Uh, now, our goal was to be finished by the end of the year. We're not too sure how that's going to happen. The Lord, uh, who knows what the Lord will do, uh, but we'll schedule more meetings for next year. Uh, we, we've been able to have some time to look at Mindy's visa at the moment and, and see what we got to do and all that. So we've been able to kind of... Uh, uh, take care of some of those uh, administrative things during this time and and so the Lord's been doing good and so thank you so much for your faithfulness and our support and, and, and in your prayers and uh, we hope to uh, get to Australia one of these days if they open up the border one of these days so thank you very much Amen. All right. we talked about opening up the borders of Australia I think that's the uh, 
Would that be the ocean, Brother Gary? Is that, is that the way that works? But anyway, uh, <clears throat> but praise the Lord for that. And, of course, uh, the Canadian border has been closed for some time. And, of course, they're under similar uh, restrictions as we are. And so you do continue to pray. And that's a, that's a praise to be sure that uh, Brother Palace has decided to take on uh, the Tingsons without them even having to go over there. And that's, uh, that's a blessing. And maybe at some point uh, they'll be able to go and, and, uh, and share their work with those folks. Uh, even though they've already been taken on. What a wonderful thing that is. Well, this morning <clears throat> we heard from uh, Brother Glenn Seymour about what God is doing in, uh, in the Spanish department through all of this. Of course, they had their first service uh, this afternoon, 1 o'clock, and uh, that, uh, what a blessing for them to be able to meet together as we did uh, earlier this morning and then uh, on Wednesday night as well. But uh, praise the Lord for that. I've asked Brother John to come and share just a brief testimony about what's going on in Lake Crest Baptist School. Of course, uh, this would be uh, the start of the last week of classes at Lake Crest Baptist School. And of course, we haven't uh, had, like everyone else, we haven't been in, in class since the middle of March. And I appreciate so much uh, what our teachers have done. And Brother John will expound upon that. Brother John, you come. And then after you're done with that, if you'll have a word of prayer for those that are sick. Well, amen. We've had a great year of school. Amen. I uh, appreciate it, really. Uh, it has been a great year, uh, a very uh, unusual year, to say the least. Uh, the first three quarters were tremendous. Uh, everything went good, and then we were hit in the face with this. But I can't say enough about our teachers. Our teachers have done an outstanding job uh, getting things together. I've, I, in many cases, there's been more work to get things ready to send home than there have been if people would have just come, been able to be able to come to school. Uh, not only with the material that had to be sent home but videos uh, zoom classroom settings all kinds of different things it's just been a been a been a exciting uh, last quarter of the school year to say the least and this uh, week is very important week uh, Tuesday's graduation amen uh, we have our, our k4 k5 and our 12th graders our last day of school is Tuesday amen of course, we won't have a graduation service here on Tuesday, but we will have graduation service. Uh, but I wish I could tell you the date that we are going to have it, but we're going to walk. We're going to have cap and gown. We're going to be uh, uh, diplomas and good to go. And we'll, as soon as we figure that out, we'll let you guys know. And then the rest of the school, first through 11th grade, your last day of school is on Friday. Amen. And uh, honestly, uh, the, t the staff have done a tremendous job getting things ready and being prepared. But, all, but this couldn't be done without our parents. Uh, if our parents aren't on board with this, then nothing, nothing's going to get done. And, man, our students have done an outstanding job, but really uh, a, a lot of the credit and a lot of the, uh, the thankfulness goes to our, our, our parents. You, you, the folks that uh, send your children to our school, man, it's an honor and privilege of ours to help you uh, in the teaching and training aspect of your young people's lives, and you've done a great job. And I can't thank you enough for your patience with us and your support for sure. And, man, uh, we're able to finish on time, uh, good to go, and we feel really good about how the school year has ended under the circumstances and we're excited about what the Lord has for us in the future. Amen. God's been very, very good to us and we give him all the honor and glory and we want to thank the parents uh, very much for all your hard work and your support uh, throughout this endeavor. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and, uh, and go to the Lord in prayer right now. Heavenly Father, Lord, we sure do love you. Lord, we're so thankful for all that you've done and Lord, we, we, we just want to stop and pause and humble ourselves before you and, and just um, again uh, recognize our helplessness. Uh, Lord, we're, without you, we can do absolutely nothing. And Lord, we understand that. But Lord, when we go through situations such as we have in these last couple months, it's magnified just how helpless we are. And Lord, how much we need you. And Lord, uh, as Pastor preached this morning, we don't want to just come back and be where we were before. Lord, we want to have a hunger and thirst uh, to just uh, see you do great and mighty things that, that we've never even experienced. And for these things to come to pass, we've got to have your power. It's all about you. It has nothing to do with us and who we are and our abilities. It's in spite of who we are. It's your presence and your power and your blessing upon the work. And, Lord, we're begging you to do what only you're capable of doing. Lord, we need your wisdom in, the, in times like this. Lord, we want to do right. We want to have the mind of God. Lord, there's all kinds of people have su their suggestions and their input. But ultimately, Lord, we, we need to be led by your power and, we, and your spirit. And we need your wisdom. Lord, we pray that you would just continue to pour out your blessing upon this place. Lord, we're so thankful for our pastor. Lord, we're thankful that uh, his faithfulness, uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, giving us the word of God uh, th through the internet. And Lord, keep us encouraged and keep us on top. Lord, I pray that you just help us to understand uh, the work that was involved in that. Be thankful for it and continue to pray uh, for our pastor in this great church. We're thankful for the great country that we live in. Lord, help us not to take America for granted. But Lord, I pray that you'd help us to uh, be, be the salt and the light that's necessary.
necessary to see this country do great things for you. Lord, we're thankful for our president. Lord, we pray that your hand would be upon him, and Lord, that you would lead him and guide him, protect him. Uh, Lord, help him to be influenced by uh, the folks that you would have him be influenced by. Uh, and Lord, just keep him from evil. And Lord, we're thankful that we have an opportunity to pray one for another. And Lord, there are a lot of great needs here. And Lord, as uh, Pastor mentioned, uh, many of them, uh, Lord, we do lift up the Saldana family. And Lord, we just ask your blessing to be upon them in a, in a miraculous way that you'd just give them a peace that would pass all understanding. And Lord, I pray that you'd be with the Barker family and the Schneider family, Lord, Bernie Braun and his family. Lord, there are so many folks that are struggling with their health. Lord, we think of uh, Hunter Sergal and Amari Martin, Allie Morgan. And Lord, I pray that you just continue to be not only with them, but with their families. And Lord, we rejoice over the good reports about Amari. He's doing tremendous, doing much better than what the doctors ever could have imagined at this point. And, Lord, we thank you, and we give you all the honor and all the glory for that. And, Lord, again, there's many, many needs. And, Lord, many of these are health needs. But, Lord, there's a lot of other needs. Uh, Lord, there's, there's family situations and uh, relationship situations, financial situations. And, Lord, we just pray that uh, your hand and your will would be done concerning all of these things. But, Lord, I pray that in, in Jesus' name, that, Lord, you would forgive us for our uh, sin of apathy and taking things things for granted and uh, Lord I'm talking about my own self and Lord I pray that you would uh, help us Lord just not just come back and be where we were before but Lord help us come back with a brand new zeal a brand new energy a brand new vigor that can only be established and brought forth be through you and who you are and not because of who we are but only because of who you are Lord we love you we pray for your presence and power on the service tonight we'll thank you for it for it's in Jesus wonderful name we do pray amen Amen. That's a blessing. Take your songbooks once more. I did it, didn't I? Old habits. Uh, no one ever cared for me like Jesus. That's right. Brother Curtis is opening up his imaginary book over there. But uh, let's have you stand one more time. Give you a chance to stretch a little bit. We'll sing the first and last verses. A great hymn written by a man named Charles Weigel. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. Jesus, since I found in him a friend so strong and true, I would tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. Sing it on the third verse. Every day he comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand his words of love. But I'll never know just why he came to save me. Till someday I see his blessed face above. No one ever cared for me. standing and take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, tonight to the, uh, the book of Luke, Luke chapter number 22, Luke chapter number 22, and we'll read our text uh, for the message tonight, Luke chapter number 22. While you're turning there, there's, uh, there's some people that I want to recognize tonight. I so much appreciate, uh, and I don't want to leave anybody out, that's for sure, and so if I do, please forgive me. I'm sure there's others who just kind of pitched in and, and helped along the way. But uh, those who have uh, helped us clean the buildings in between services, between Wednesday and today, and then, of course, between this morning and this evening service, I appreciate our staff uh, for pitching in. Also, uh, the Simmons family and, uh, and the Bird family and uh, Mrs. Raymaker. And I'm, I'm sure there are others, and please forgive me if you helped out some and I didn't call your name. 
But, uh, but let's give these folks a hand, shall we? <clears throat> That's a blessing. You got your Bible in your hand there. <laughs> uh, and then I also want to recognize uh, the fellows that have been helping us out for the past couple of months uh, from the PA booth and all the work that's gone into getting us online. And, and of course, uh, if you're watching the service online right now, it's uh, mainly due to the work of Brother Matt Simpson, Brother Justin Horton, and we appreciate those fellows helping us out as well. And uh, it takes, uh, takes a, lot of, uh, a lot of effort uh, to, uh, that goes into any given service, and the effort's a little different now, but it's effort nonetheless. And so uh, Luke chapter 22 in your Bible, Luke chapter 22, and uh, excited about the message tonight. We'll begin reading in verse number 39, Luke chapter 22 and verse number 39. The Bible says, and he came out and went, and as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, pray that ye enter not into temptation. Verse 41, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou, uh, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Father, I pray that you'd help us tonight. And the message from the Word of God is so important uh, that we come to the garden with the Savior. Father, it's so important that we uh, uh, set, uh, hit the reset button and refresh ourselves in this matter of the importance of prayer. Oh, Father, I pray that you'd please help us this evening. There's many things that we're limited in on, on these days and uh, during the quarantine and the lockdown. And and uh, folks are apprehensive and and uh, but father we thank you that there are some things that we can do and some things that we need to determine to take up uh, several notches in our own lives and one of those things is prayer and father i pray that you'd help us tonight to see the need and to respond in a way that would please you we ask it in jesus name amen thank you for standing you can be seated on the evening before our lord was crucified he and the disciples partook of the last supper and I'm looking forward to the time when we can once again observe the Lord's table. That, uh, uh, that's uh, still a ways off, I guess, with all of the uh, concerns about uh, uh, germs and so forth. But I'm looking forward to that because it, it, it's, a, it's a sign. It's, a, uh, uh, it's something that helps us remember what Jesus did for us. And Jesus instituted that Lord's table back uh, on the evening before he was to be crucified. He spent his last night before the cross with these men whom he loved for the past three and a half years. He had called them from their normal course of business and their former profession to come and to follow him. He taught them lessons that they would need very soon as they took the gospel message to those who had never heard it before. These men had spent their lives with the Savior. They heard him preach. They saw him perform the miracles. They saw him uh, cast demons out of folks. They were there when the maniac of Gadara was made whole. They were there when the the lame man who was by the pool of Bethesda uh, took up his bed and walked. They were there when blind Bartimaeus received his sight. They were there when Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead. They were there when Lazarus was raised after having been dead for four days. They saw him weep in the, uh, at the tomb of Lazarus, and they marveled at his power to calm the raging storm on the Sea of Galilee. I'm sure there were thousands of lessons and things that they gleaned from him that they would remember throughout the rest of their lives. I can imagine uh, in the years to come after Jesus ascended back to heaven and, and uh, uh, the, the, those who were leading in the church at Jerusalem and those who were scattered abroad uh, as missionaries taking the gospel to different parts of the world, I'm sure those men who sat at the feet of Jesus for three and a half years, uh, every now and then they would, uh, they would be reminded of... Uh, of was that uh, that Jesus said to them while he was the, in his in his earthly ministry? I'm sure those those uh, challenges came back to them time after time after time throughout the remainder of their lives. Now, keep in mind the Gospels are only a portion of the acts that Jesus did. In the, as you finish out the book of John, the Bible tells us that, uh, that if everything Jesus did during his ministry were to be recorded, uh, that the, the books couldn't contain everything. So as you read the Bible, keep in mind that's just a sampling of what was done. That's, those, are, those miracles are just a sampling of the miracles. The lessons that Jesus taught his disciples that are recorded, that's just a sampling of it. 
But understand that uh, Jesus uh, did so much and spent so much time and, and invested so much of his, his life into these disciples. And now on this evening with them, after the supper, Jesus and the disciples went to the Mount of Olives. It is apparent that Jesus often went to the Mount of Olives to spend time with his heavenly Father. Now we understand, no doubt, given the nature of his travels up and down the land of Palestine, that Jesus had many places where he went to pray and where he would get along with the Lord, with his Father. But I believe this place was uniquely special to him. Because as we read in our text in Luke chapter 22, in verse number 39, listen to it if you will, and he, and he came out and went, notice what it says, as he was wont, W-O-N-T, to the Mount of Olives. You know what that tells me? He had a habit of going there. That's where he went. Whenever he was near Jerusalem, whenever he was in that area, one of his favorite places to pray would have been the Mount of Olives. And uh, I believe the Bible teaches us that very plainly. And as it turned out, this would be the place where Jesus would be separated from these men that he loved for the last time. This would be the place, as they finished up the Lord's table, you remember the sequence of events there. Uh, they partook of the, the, uh, the, the elements of the bread, and, uh, and the grape juice and so on. And, and Jesus, of course, girded himself and then washed the feet of, the, of his disciples. And uh, he said, one of you is going to betray me this night. And the disciples looked at one another and asked the Savior himself, Lord, is it I? Jesus, is it me? No one suspected Judas. And uh, as they finished up the activities there uh, in the upper room, the Bible says they, they, uh, they went, Jesus went out and the disciples followed him, except for Judas. Judas dismissed himself from the table earlier. And uh, the other 11 disciples accompanied Christ, followed him to the Mount of Olives, followed him uh, to the Garden of Gethsemane, as, uh, as we call it. In, a little, in just a little while, Judas the turncoat would come with a band of Roman soldiers and officers on the, uh, of the chief priests, and he would place the kiss of betrayal on the cheek of the Son of God. From that point on, the disciples would scatter and forsake the Savior in his most critical hour. Now you understand, Jesus knew all about what was going to happen, what, what was about to unfold, but they didn't know. They didn't know. Jesus understood that in just a few moments, in just a, a matter of a, 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 maybe a couple of hours at the most, that the disciples would be scattered, and this would be the last few moments that he would spend together with them before he went to Calvary. And it's interesting to me that Jesus chooses in his last moments with the disciples before he goes to the cross, he spends, the, he spends that time in prayer. He spends that time with them on the Mount of Olives, in the Garden of Gethsemane. He came to the garden, followed by his disciples. He instructed them to pray as he went with the inner circle, Peter, James, and John, deeper into the garden. They got there, and apparently, maybe they began to pray, and Jesus, uh, seeking uh, to be alone with his heavenly Father, he left them there to pray, while the Bible tells us that he went about a stone's throw from them to pray alone. And it's interesting to me that the last thing Jesus would do corporately with his disciples was a prayer meeting. A prayer meeting. I understand that Jesus was alone when he prayed, when he poured out his heart to the Father and agonized until his sweat was as great drops of blood, the Bible says. But the last thing Jesus led his disciples to do together before he went to the cross was to pray. Tonight, I invite all of us to spend more time in the garden with Jesus. Tonight, I invite all of us to spend more time with the Heavenly Father. Whatever your position is in this church, you'll not do anything more necessary than to become a person of prayer. I'll promise you that. I'll promise you that. I don't care what your title is. I don't care what your abilities are. I don't care uh, what, what your outreach is. Well, let me, listen to me very carefully. You'll never go any further for God than what you travel on your knees. You may be able to preach eloquent sermons, but that's no substitute for prayer. You may have the most wonderful singing voice known to man, but that will pale in comparison for your need to pray. You may be the most gifted children's worker uh, and, uh, or Sunday school teacher or bus worker, whatever, whatever the case may be. Uh, but, but what you need tonight is a personal commitment to spend time in the garden with Christ. Our country is one that is in crisis right now. I don't know if you've realized that. 
We're, we're in a crisis right now. Yes, there is the crisis, the medical pandemic that should drive us to our knees. But there's a spiritual crisis tonight as well. There's a spiritual crisis that is far more sobering than any medical. And I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, downplaying the medical crisis we're in at all. I, I, I take it seriously. We've taken some very, um, so, so we, uh, we've taken some serious steps to try to keep everybody safe. And we'll say more about that at the end of the service tonight. But you understand something. There's more to this than just a medical pandemic. There's a spiritual crisis, a spiritual warfare that is waged in our country, a spiritual warfare that is unseen by the human eye but is there. And let me tell you something, uh, we, it's time that we understood that some battles are not fought anywhere but in a prayer closet. Churches like ours all across America need to understand that our nation will not be preserved by gimmicks and bright lights and Hollywood performances and preachers who look like they came out of a local comedy club. Our nation will only be preserved as God's people discover the need to get back into the garden with Jesus Christ. That's where it's going to happen. That's where it's going to happen. I want you to come to me tonight, come with me, I should say, into the garden with the Savior. I want you to look at this place. Look at what it says in our text in Luke chapter 22 and verse uh, number 40. The Bible says, and when he was at the place. When he was at the place. I want you to see, first of all, to the, tonight, it was a solitary place. It was a solitary place where Jesus prayed one of the great truths of prayer is found right here. This is certainly, I'm sorry, this certainly was not the only place of prayer for the Savior, but it was definitely a solitary place. It was a place where he got alone. It was a place that no one else went with him. Oh, yes, the disciples were there. Uh, eight of them were there, if my math serves me correctly. And they were there into, in the garden. And then he took three more, Peter, James, and John, with him further into the garden. And he said, now, look, fellas, I want you to stay here. And I want you to pray that you enter not into temptation. He said, I understand your, your, your flesh is, uh, uh, your spirit's willing, your flesh is weak. He said, but I, I need you to pray with me now. But when, in praying with him, he still found a solitary place. The Bible says he went about a stone's throw and he knelt and he got along with his heavenly father and he agonized in prayer and he wept in prayer and the bible says his sweat was as it were great drops of blood but i want you to see tonight first of all it was a solitary place Amen. a solitary place he was withdrawn from them the bible says now did he like to spend time with these men of course he did i'm sure there was great fellowship between jesus and those disciples I would have loved to have just kind of been the fly on the wall in their meetings. I would have loved to have been around them. I'm sure that there, oh yes, there were lessons that were taught and there was all kinds of things. I believe, I believe they laughed together. I, I believe that. Uh, uh, every time I look in the mirror, I'm reminded that God has a sense of humor. So, <laughs> but uh, I'm convinced they, they laughed together. I'm convinced they cried together. They ate meals together. They did all kinds of things as a group. Did Jesus enjoy the fellowship uh, of these men? Of course he did. Did he enjoy their companionship? There's no doubt about it. But there were times when Jesus had to withdraw himself from them and everybody else in order to spend time with his father. You read about the earthly ministry of our Savior. You, read about, you talk about someone who was a busy person. Jesus was busy. The Bible says the crowds thronged him. He had, to, he had to work to get away from people just to have a solitary place many times. Jesus was busy. You talk about the sermons that he preached. You, th you think about the lessons that he taught, the miracles that he performed, the individuals that he helped just along the wayside, just as he passed from town to town, as he, as he traveled the length and breadth of Palestine. He was a busy person, but yet he still found time to, in that solitary place to be alone with his father. He understood he had to do that. He had to do that. We live in a very connected society where, to be honest, it can be very much of a challenge to get to a solitary place. But may I say tonight, we need to have a solitary place. Everybody in this room, if, you're, if you claim the name of Jesus Christ, you need time alone with God. You need to have a place in the garden, so to speak, 
It doesn't have to be a garden. It can be a prayer closet. It can be uh, a basement. It can be uh, by a bedside. It can be out in the woods somewhere. But hey, everybody here needs a place, a solitary place to get along with God for you to spend time with your Heavenly Father. It's a challenge. We live in a, in a society, we live in a, a day and time where we have the internet, and thank God for it. There's a lot of good things about it. Many of you are watching this and able to hear the service and, and, uh, and be ministered to because of the internet connection. Thank God for it. By the way, I challenge you to maybe, maybe share that with people. God is using it in a great way for people who may never darken the doorways of this church to hear the gospel. And I, you know, I, I, uh, I commend those of you that go out of your way to try to, to try to help other people hear the message. And that's a wonderful thing. Uh, thank God for, uh, for uh, you know, we have things like the you know, cell phones and social media and so forth. Now, understand something. Those things are not awful or sinful at all in and of themselves. But we're never going to have the power of God for anything until we learn to trade social for the solitary. We've got to trade the social for the solitary. Churches aren't built through social media, although, thank, again, thank God for it. And uh, we're, we're finding it that, that, that it's a very useful tool to get our name out there. And that's a wonderful thing for, for people to be introduced to the ministries and hopefully introduced to Jesus Christ. But let me tell you something. If we ever get to the point where we trade off the solitary for the social, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. Thank God for the tools that are available to us. And, and, and to use them as a church to reach people. Please don't, uh, don't misunderstand where I'm going here. We need to use them, and, and we are using them more and more. That's a tremendous thing. But the great need of the day is not more tools. It's for the people of our church to spend more time with God. More time with God. I, uh, I have a, like most of you do, <clears throat> I have a cell phone, amen? There's sometimes I wish I didn't have a cell phone, to be honest with you. But may I say something about that little contraption right there? It'll dominate your life if we don't learn to control it. Again, it's a wonderful invention. Thank God for it. Thank God for it. Let's use it for the glory of God. And by the way, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything ought to be done for God's glory. And anything that you have or anything that you're involved in that's not being used for God's glory is, is, uh, is not what you were intended to do. Now, listen very carefully. I, uh, I got under conviction the other day from my cell phone. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about? <clears throat> I, uh, I picked it up, and once a week I get a message and this happens to be an iPhone, and I'm sure you Android users probably have the same kind of contraption that shows up on yours as well. But it said, uh, it said screen time. This week you spent an average of such and such number of hours with your screen. And immediately, I didn't hear an audible voice. I'm not trying to be spooky tonight. But it was as if the Holy Spirit of God said to me, did you spend that much time with me this week? conviction you know what it it doesn't have to be sinful to separate you from your god and again the message is not anti-cell phone anti-technology anti-social media anti-internet that's not the message at all on the contrary let's use those what i'm saying while we're while we're trying to further the gospel socially with the tools god has given us that is not a substitute for a solitary time with god and a solitary place with God. That's where we'll find the answers. That's where our families are going to be helped. The solitary place. Hey, that's where, that's where our church is going to grow. The solitary place. That's where, uh, that's where we're going to see the, uh, the miracles. That's where we're going to understand the great power of God that we talk about often. But hey, let me tell you something. The power of God doesn't come through a prescription. The power of God doesn't come through a channel. The power of God doesn't come through, uh, through an app on a phone. The power of God comes through the solitary place of time spent with them. So number one, it's a solitary place. Number two, we'll notice it's a sheltering place. It's a sheltering place. Notice what he said. 
Luke chapter 22, back in our text, in verse number 40. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. Now, he, I believe the context there is not ask God not to take you into temptation. The context is pray so that you are not tempted. Pray so that you can avoid the temptation. Pray so that you're sheltered, if you will, from the temptation. One of the greatest protections during times of trouble is prayer. One of the greatest protections. I'm not saying that every time you pray, God is going to shield you or somehow deliver you. You understand something. There have been many people who have died a martyr's death who were praying, God, would you deliver me? God, would you deliver me? God, you know, it's not always God's will to deliver people. You understand, we've talked about the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. My shack, your shack, and a bungalow, whatever, anyway. Just making sure you're paying attention. But we talk about those guys, and they said, Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, our God is able to deliver us. You understand the rest of that? But if not. <laughs> We're willing to become a French fry if that's what it takes. Because God may not have been willing to deliver them. But you understand something? Jesus said to his disciples, he said, I want you to pray that you enter not into temptation. He knew he was about to go through the trial of his life. Jesus understood where he was on the timeline of his life. He knew his time was short. He knew that in just a few hours he was going to be stand, uh, sitting in the house of Caiaphas and they were going to buffet him and they were going to beat him with the palms of their hands and they were going to rip his beard from his face. He knew everything. He knew they were going to spit on him. He knew in just a little while after that he was going to appear before Pilate and he was going to, uh, to, to be sent over to Herod and stand before him and sent back to Pilate and then scourged with the Roman cat of nine tails. He understood in just a few hours he was going to, to, uh, uh, to bear the weight of that cross and then to hang on that cross and bear the sin of humanity. Humanity. He understood that it was the Father's will for him to go through all of that. And he said, God, not my will, but thine be done. But he also, look, the, uh, he also knew the disciples were about to go through something. He knew what was coming for him. They did not know what was coming for them. Jesus knew they were going to face the temptation. He had just told Peter a few hours before this. He said, now look, Peter, uh, you're going to deny me. Remember what Peter said? Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Jesus, do you understand who you're talking to? <laughs> I'll die for you before I deny you. Jesus said, no, Peter, I'm just telling you. Before the sun comes up tomorrow, you're going to deny me three times. What? It was unbelievable to him. He had no idea what was in store, but Jesus knew. And maybe that's what prompted the Savior to say to the disciples, hey, you need to pray so that you enter not into temptation. Pray so that you're sheltered from the temptation. And the application tonight is this. You know, we need to pray so that we can endure what's ahead of us. I don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. I have no idea. You don't know what tomorrow holds. Proverbs chapter, somewhere along in there, 22, 23, somewhere boast not thyself of tomorrow for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth we have no idea what's going to happen so we better be prayed up the protection from the outside elements the protection the spiritual battle is won on our knees and so many times we fail when the time of temptation comes the time of testing comes and we fall miserably on our face why because we haven't gotten strength from God in the solitary place we find, first, it was a solitary place. Number two, it was a sheltering place. Number three, it was a surrendering place. A surrendering place. Look at verse 42. Saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, but thine be done. There's a lot of speculation and preaching about what, was, what Jesus referred to as the cup. That's not the point of the message tonight. But Jesus said, it doesn't matter what's in the cup. Father, if it's your will, then I'm surrendering my will to yours. You see, prayer is where we find the strength to surrender our will to the Father. That's where we find it. You say, wait a minute, Pastor. Prayer is where we find the strength to surrender our will to the Father. You know, that, that sounds counterintuitive, to be strong enough to surrender. <laughs> But your flesh will not surrender until your spirit is strengthened. 
You see, the Bible is very clear about it. Galatians chapter 5 and other passages where the Bible teaches us that our flesh is, is constantly at war against the spirit that lives inside of us, the new man versus the old man. They're at odds with each other all the time. And I'm afraid many times we lose the battle of surrendering our will to the Father's will because we're living in the flesh and not the Spirit. When we're living in the flesh, hey, there is no surrender. When the flesh is winning out, when we feed the flesh, when we give in to the flesh, and when, when, we, when we don't spend time in the garden with the Savior, when we don't stay in our Bibles, when we don't strengthen ourselves in the, in the Spirit, guess what? There is no surrender. And we see here that the place where Jesus was was a place of surrender. The word of God and prayer is where we find the wherewithal to surrender to what God wants rather than demanding that we get what we want. That's where we are many times, isn't it? God, here's how we pray. God, I want this and I want this and I want this and I want this. And if you don't give me what I want, God, I'm going to take my ball and go home. That's our attitude. That's our attitude. You know what that is indicative of? A Christian who's dominated by his flesh. It's all about me, God. It's all about what I want, God. Here's my laundry list. Here's my grocery list. You give me what I want, God. That's not, that's not biblical prayer. Hey, getting in the garden with Jesus, is, it's a serenity. It's a solitary place. You get alone by yourself with the Lord. And, and, and uh, however hard you have to work at getting alone with God is worth the effort. And it's a sheltering place. Through prayer, God sustains us through times of trial and temptation and testing. And then we see it's a surrendering place. A surrendering place. You who struggle with doing the will of God, may I make a suggestion? Come to the garden with Jesus. Those of you who right now, there's, an, there's a struggle in the inner man. Uh, you know uh, through, through the, the revealed will of God in your life, you know God has a plan for you. And you know that your plan for you differs from God's plan for you. May I encourage you, the more time you spend in the garden with Jesus, the more likely you are to surrender to what he wants rather than insist on what you want. As you bow in his presence, he'll give you the grace to surrender what you want in exchange for his will then i want you to see number four we said it was a solitary place we said it's a strengthening place we uh, uh we said also it's a sheltering place number four i want you to notice it was a strengthening place a strengthening place look with me if you will verse number 43 luke 22 verse 43 and there appeared an angel unto him from heaven strengthening him strengthening him now I'll be very transparent with you right here. I don't pretend to know exactly what that means in this passage except to take it at face value. Because the very next verse says that he, he further agonized in prayer and it references him sweating, as it were, great drops of blood. But apparently, physically, understand, Jesus being 100% God but also 100% man. He got tired. He got weary. And in the struggle, and by the way, when, when it comes to prayer, if you do it long enough, it's work. It can be laborious to pray. And Jesus is so earnest in his prayer, so, so, so much of a struggle with this, uh, in, in, in prayer. I'm not saying he struggled against his father. That's not what I'm saying at all because the Bible just had just mentioned that he was surrendered to his will. But I'm saying the agony of knowing what he was about to go through was so great, but it was in prayer that he found strength. An angel came. I believe an angel came and literally physically ministered to him and gave him physical strength to keep on praying. Now listen very carefully. There is a strength that only comes through prayer. I'm talking about a physical strength that only comes through prayer. I'm talking about a physical stamina that only comes through prayer. Take your Bible and turn with me back over to Isaiah chapter 40, if you will. Isaiah chapter 40, very familiar passage, but I think it, it bears repeating tonight. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter number 40, and we'll begin reading in verse number 29. I'll, I'll start reading and finish out the chapter. You uh, follow along when you catch up. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number 29. Hear what the Lord says. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases what? Strength. He increases what? 
strength. That's the beauty of having live services again. When I said that in, in front of a television camera, nobody said anything. But anyway. <laughs> to them that have no might, he increases strength. Now notice verse 30. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. So, question. Is he talking about physical strength right now? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Look at verse number 31. That's the context for this verse that we quote so often. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their what? Strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Hey, what's he talking to? He's talking about gaining strength from the Lord. Well, what's the answer according to Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31? They that wait upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. I believe part of waiting on the Lord is spending time with them. I believe part of waiting on the Lord is serving him just like a waiter would, 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 uh, would serve tables at a restaurant. Can't do that now, but one day. Uh, but uh, uh, but, but uh, there's, there's several connotations for a wait upon, but one of them is inescapable to, to, uh, but to admit, hey, you got to spend time with the Lord and be strengthened. In the garden with Jesus was a strengthening place, a solitary place. In the garden of Jesus was, was, a, uh, was a place of shelter and surrender. Then I want you to notice lastly this, this evening, this is going to sound a little bit strange when I say it, it was a sleeping place. <laughs> it was a sleeping place. Now, I'm not going to be too critical of the disciples right here because anyone who has ever set out to spend more time in prayer has fallen asleep. How many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. You get halfway around the world, praying for the missionaries, and you wake up 30 minutes later, and you got drool coming outside of your mouth, and sweet time of fellowship right there, amen. But if you've ever set out to pray earnestly, that has happened to you at some point. I'll promise you that. So I'm not going to be too critical of the disciples who fell asleep. Remember, Jesus came back to them and said, hey, fellas, couldn't you watch with me one hour? <laughs> fellas, couldn't you, couldn't you stay awake long enough to bear with me in my burden for one hour? And he, come, and he goes back and prays some more, comes back, and the same thing happened. And what did he say? Sleep on now. <laughs> Music to a Baptist ears. Sleep on now. But I want you to see tonight it was a sleeping place. And instead of being really critical of the disciples, I want to kind of make a backdoor application to this, if I may. Whatever struggle you have to go through to increase your time in the garden with Jesus is well worth it. Amen. Let me say it again. Whatever struggle you have to go through to increase your time in the garden with Jesus is well worth the struggle. These men were not finished products. By the way, neither are any of us. <laughs> we are all a work in progress, amen? But you understand something? These men who were sleeping on the job, so to speak, these people who Jesus entrusted to pray with him there in the Garden of Gethsemane in his greatest hour of need, these were the same men who in about 50 days were going to shake Jerusalem with the gospel. Wow. Wow. Can I tell you something? You read between Luke 22 and Acts chapter 2 in those 50 days right there. I'm working on a message now talking about this, the, the disciples in quarantine, amen, coming to a pulpit near you. But... But at some point, those disciples decided, you know what? We're going to hang in there when it comes to this matter of prayer. Amen. We're not going to let the fact that we let down our Savior in his greatest hour of need keep us from staying in the struggle, Amen. from staying after it. Hey, if your prayer life is struggling right now, I'm not here to beat you up. I'm here to say whatever you got to do, whatever struggle you got to go through to get that prayer life going is worth it. Amen. It's worth it. Prayer is a big league activity for the child of God, and that's why not many people answer the challenge. That's just the reality of it. Prayer is such an important task. Let me tell you something. The demons of hell tremble when God's people get serious about prayer. That's right. 
when God's people get really serious about prayer, all hell takes notice. That's right. You see, we don't see it that way. We tend to depend upon our charisma, our personality, our education. Not against those things. God can use them in a great way. But let me tell you something. On the grand scale of what, how God moves and how God works, look, prayer is where it's at. When we work, we work. When we pray, God works. And let me tell you something. God's ability to work far exceeds any of ours. And Satan knows that. And prayer is such a big league activity for the child of God. And that's why not many people answer the challenge to pray. Not many people are interested. Why? Because it's not showcased. It's not pedestal. It's not noticed. It's not, it's not applauded. It's, 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 it's tedious. It's in, it's in private. Nobody knows whether we pray or not. We can go days, weeks, months. Nobody knows about it. But let me tell you, that's where the power is. That's where the power is. Now, I'm going to wrap it up by saying this. If we're going to be an advancing church, we must first learn to advance in prayer. That's where it's at. I'm all for everything else that we do. Praise the Lord for it. But you understand something. We like to turn over to Acts chapter 2 and read about 3,000 people getting saved, baptized, and joining the church in one day. You know why that happened? There was a prevailing prayer among those people. There was, there was 50 days. Hey, it was Jesus who said it in Acts chapter 1. He said, he said I want you to tarry at Jerusalem. In other words, I'm going to quarantine you. <laughs> tarry at Jerusalem until you be endued with power. They didn't just sit around in the upper room in Jerusalem saying, well, I wonder when it's going to come. Somebody tell me when the power comes. Then I'll stand up and start. No, no, they were praying. There was an earnestness about it. Now, I'm going to give you one challenge and we're done. Let me ask you, first of all, will you take the challenge? Regardless of where your prayer life is, again, I'm, I'm not here to beat you up tonight if your prayer life is non-existent. That's not, that's not the purpose of the message at all. But the purpose of the message is to challenge you to stay in the struggle. Some of you need to get back to the struggle. Preacher, I tried that whole prayer thing and it just doesn't work for me. Preacher, you know, I, every time I, it seems every time I set out to pray, it's just, it's, it's like they're bouncing off the ceiling and hit me in the back of the head. There's just, preacher, there, there's just no use. Oh yeah, there's use. If you understood how powerful a weapon and how powerful a tool it was, you stay with the struggle. Here's my challenge tonight. Regardless of how much time you spend in prayer, I want you to add 15 minutes to it. Everybody can do that. Yes, sir. If you're, look, if you don't have any kind of a significant prayer life, 15 minutes would be a huge step in the right direction. Yes, Again, I'm not going to beat up these disciples, these these uh, men who gave of themselves, who walked with the Savior and listened to him and heard him preach and saw him do miracles, I'm not going to beat them up for falling asleep while they were trying to pray. Hey, but I am saying, hey, wake up and start praying again. Get up and get back on your face before God again. Mom and dad, get back on your face before your, your, uh, your kids again. Sunday school teacher, you can't meet with them right now, but you dead sure can pray for them. Hey, bus worker, you can't pick them on Sunday for obvious reasons, but you sure can pray for them. Hey, I'm simply saying, whatever struggle you have, well, however you may have fallen asleep in the prayer closet, wake up and get back at it. It's well worth the struggle if we learn to pray. So, will you take the challenge tonight? Whatever your habit is of prayer, I challenge you, Add 15 minutes to it. 15 minutes. There are 168 hours in our week. All of us have the same amount of time. Doesn't matter how wealthy one may be or how 
poverty stricken another may be, everyone has the same amount of hours in the week. Amen. How many of those will we redeem by spending time in the garden with the Savior? How many of those hours will we make the most of by getting God in? By the way, that's what prayer is, getting God involved in our lives. Let's get God involved in our homes. Let's get God involved in our, in our church. Let's go to God on behalf of our nation. Let's go to God on behalf of our president. And I would say that if I disagreed with everything the man ever did. Because that's what the Bible says we're supposed to do. In, in, in past administrations, when I had very little in common with the President of the United States as far as what, how, how we believed, it was still, and I'll sad to say, I, I failed miserably many times, but it was my God-given responsibility to bring him before the throne of grace. Amen. And it's our responsibility. Amen. Boy, we need a revival. Amen. Revive us again. Yes. Revival doesn't come through showcase Christianity. Yes. Revival comes through closet Christianity. I challenge you tonight, whatever your prayer life is, tack on 15 minutes of prayer. Let's prove him. Let's prove him. Let's spend time in the solitary place, in the garden with the Savior, our Heavenly Father. I pray that you'd help us tonight. Such a challenge, such a, a daunting challenge that we have before us. We're living in a, in a country that is in crisis. Father, not just a physical, medical crisis of a pandemic. Father, I'm not belittling that or taking that lightly at all. Father, we ask you to bless those who are on the front lines of that, and we ask you to encourage them and strengthen them. But Father, beyond that, there's a spiritual crisis in our country. And Father, that spiritual battle won't be won anywhere except on our knees and on our face before you. Father, I pray that we would step up to the challenge tonight. Father, for that one who's kind of fallen asleep in the prayer closet, I pray they'd be encouraged. Father, in no way do I want to discourage. I don't want anybody to just throw in the towel and say, oh, it's just not worth it because it is. Father, I pray that you forgive us for our humanity and how we fail you so many times. But Father, help us to get back on our knees, to wake up, as it were, and to stay with the struggle. Because any struggle that leads us to a greater walk with you is well worth the struggle. And I pray that you'd help us. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'd ask Brother Fred if you'll just play something very softly. <clears throat> We're not going to give an invitation where you come forward necessarily, but how many would say, Pastor Dale... <clears throat> First of all, I know I'm saved. I know I'm a Christian. I know I'm going to heaven when I die. I'm not, I'm not ashamed of that. And I'll raise my hand as a testimony to that. Can you raise your hand tonight? Are you saved? Do you know for sure that you're saved? That's wonderful. That's great. How many Christians tonight would say, Pastor Dale, God has spoken to my heart in this matter of prayer. God has spoken to me in such a way that I'm going to take the challenge and I'm going to, I'm going to add on 15 minutes to my prayer life every day. From now on, I've, I've fallen asleep a little bit, to be honest, preacher, but I'm going to get back in the struggle tonight. Would you join me? How many would say, preacher, I'm, I'm making that commitment tonight. God bless you. God bless you. You know, prayer is something that we need to make as a priority. You say, preacher, it's awkward. You know, you're, you're talking to the Lord. <laughs> you're talking to the one that we preached about this morning who loves you more than you could possibly realize. And when you meet God in the garden, so to speak, I can't tell you how thrilled he is that you're there. Let me encourage tonight, stay in the struggle. As he plays just a few moments with your head bowed and your eyes closed, just... Do business with the Lord right there where you're seated. Just ask the Lord to give you the grace. Ask him to give you the grace to stay with it. To stay with it.
God help us be a people of prayer. Father, we thank you for the privilege to have met together tonight. Father, thank you for these who've come. Thank you for those who are watching by way of the of uh, Facebook Live, the internet. And Father, I know there's there's still a lot of fear, a lot of folks who have some trepidation about about coming out in public and being around folks, even with social distancing and so forth. Father, I, I certainly understand that, and we we sympathize. And Father, I pray that you just help us, regardless of how we're meeting tonight, would you help all of us decide that we're going to be a people of prayer, that we're going to get back in the struggle, so to speak, wake up in our prayer life. I pray that you'd bless us. Help us to spend time in that solitary, surrendered place. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight. One word before we're dismissed. And uh, I appreciate so much your, your help with uh, the guidelines and the social distancing. I've never, I haven't seen anybody saying, well, this is my seat. I'm going to sit here regardless of what anybody thinks. <laughs> and, and nobody's done that, and I certainly appreciate that. Uh, one thing that I do think we need to, to maybe give some attention to is, and, and trust me, th this goes against my grain big time because how many times have you heard me say over the last five and a half years, you know, don't, don't leave the building like it's on fire after the service, okay? So what I'm about to say really goes against the grain of, of, of how I feel, but it's, it's necessary for, for now, and, uh, and a little bit later on, we'll have the opportunity to, to fellowship and so on, but uh, don't linger after the final amen. Look, if you want to go out in the parking lot and fellowship uh, six feet apart, that's awesome, man. Praise the Lord. And uh, there's, uh, there's fresh air, and the wind just kind of blows those germs all over the place anyway. And so, uh, <clears throat> but uh, that's great. But, uh, but let's, uh, let's, let, let's exit the building in, uh, I'm not saying you got to run <laughs> or anything like that, but let's exit the building in a timely manner so that, uh, so that folks who, who are just a little bit hesitant um, are, uh, feel a little better about things. And, you know, I don't want to jeopardize at all what we have right now. Okay, and I think everybody would say a hearty amen to that. This is awesome. Praise the Lord for it. But, uh, but families, uh, you know, mom and dad, keep your, keep your children close with you. And uh, this morning, I, uh, uh, customarily, my wife and I would be uh, the last to leave on Sunday morning. But uh, we got out of here pretty, pr pretty uh, uh, rapidly, not because I didn't want to see anybody. That, quite the opposite, but uh, I do want to set a good example <laughs> about that. But, uh, but anyway, so uh, help us with that, if you will. Uh, that being said, we do have two offering plates, one on each table in, uh, in the lobby. We're not able to take a, an offering as we normally would for obvious reasons. But, uh, but if, you do want, if you have your tithes and offerings, you want to drop those in, the, in those plates on the way out, that would be wonderful. If you want to give online, that's, uh, that's great as well. I appreciate the efforts in getting us up and running on text giving. Online giving has gone up substantially in the last several weeks obvious, for obvious reasons, but uh, praise the Lord for that. But uh, we'll have a word of prayer, and uh, we'll be dismissed. Don't forget, Wednesday night, uh, 7 o'clock, right here in the auditorium. Look forward to having everyone there. Let's all stand together, and uh, we'll be dismissed. Brother Glenn, if you'll dismiss us in prayer, sir. We're thankful, Father, for the message we've heard tonight. And, uh, I know I am um, rebuked, dear Father, and might uh, help me to keep these words close to my heart for him for all of us father to rise up a mighty uh, army prayer uh, right here for our nation for our families for our homes for our church for folks to be saved lord this week lord pray for your grace lord uh, pray for you might keep us safe lord in jesus name amen, amen. amen.